Hi, this is John Reed. I'm live from NRF 2020, otherwise known as the big show, arguably the biggest retail event over the year, though I know one other event that might argue about that. But anyway, it's a great kickoff in New York City every year. I'm joined by Jake Knowles. We've never met before, but we're doing it now. How you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for having me, John. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Tell listeners a little bit about what you do. You have a passion for retail. Why? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a senior retail consultant at a, at a company called BJSS based out of London in the UK. And yeah, I think I have a passion for retail purely because I think everyone's a customer, everyone's involved, right? It's not like financial services or commodities where there is that specialism and there's that requirement for education. Everyone buys things every single day and, and everyone's involved in the industry. So I just find it intriguing that you could speak to, to any old Joe on the street and they, they have an opinion in what is, for me, the most exciting industry in the world. Yeah, NR, NRF is a nutty show, and one of the challenges for the podcaster like me is there's not too many quiet spaces, so we are in a kind of loud space for our listeners, but hopefully as long as no one tries to vacuum like they did last year, we should be good. <laughs> um, but the reason I like to do this, uh, and I and I heard from, from Jake's company by email, he just seemed like the most interesting guy that I was contacted by who really studies this market and has strong opinions. So we're going to see how it goes, making sense of what just happened the last three days. Uh, you're with BJSS. Tell us a little bit about uh, like what your company is tracking in retail right now. Yeah, so we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of, of different trends, and especially in, in the UK market, I guess the real issue is um, the squeezing bottom line. And Brexit, we, we didn't get very lot far until we mentioned that word, but um, oh, right, we're yeah. seeing... Um, yeah, we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of tension and a lot of pressure and something we'll get onto, I'm sure, is innovation. And one of the big things for innovation is that, that risk that there isn't a tangible ROI. So, so retailers are really struggling to, to segment that and, and have budget that isn't really trackable to, to ROI. And I think we're really seeing our clients be, be hesitant to innovate in that way. But the real problem is if you don't innovate, then, then someone else will. And, and you're going to spend your time treading water rather than, rather than really expanding and, and accelerating. So that's a, that's a real issue we're finding with our clients that's one of the really interesting things about retail is is that it's such a winners and losers market right and so you get to really fi- try to figure out like what is defining the difference between the two right and what are the ingredients to success especially when most companies have access to similar technology so yeah. how do you do it and that's why we're here right yeah. that's that's, what, that's why we're here that that's why i was on a panel just yesterday and and yeah, there are, there's different opinions, there's different approaches, and, and there is no recipe for success. There is no silver bullet that's, that's going to fix this, unfortunately. So it's about really knowing your brand, knowing your strategy for success, and, and, and doing it with confidence and conviction, I think. So I want to talk, talk to you about the session that you put on, because I think that's a pretty interesting customer session that you did. But before we get there, were there any like surprises? It's been like a bustling three days of meetings. Did anything surprise you or that you really noticed this year? Yeah, so, so I was here last year as well, so it, it's quite good to compare, compare. I think this year, I have to say, from what I've seen, it, we, we've dialed back on, on the sexy stuff. So last year was snazzy experiences, here's the latest tech, all that kind yeah. of stuff. And, and there's still the robots around, but... But I really, did see a lot of robots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but really, from the CEOs, and, and I was listening to Eric Nordstrom this morning, and it's this, I've heard it three or four times from, from, from the big weeks here, is we're going back to the customer now. We're, we're not talking about the technology or the experience that we're providing. We're talking about fundamentally understanding the customer, what they want and need, and what they might need in the future. So, so we've, we've, dialed, we've dialed it back a bit, and we've gone back to basics, which, are, which I think is really interesting compared to last year. Yeah, I, I saw a little bit less hype around experience this year, which was nice. Uh, you know, last year I saw experience yeah, everywhere. Yeah, 100%. Um, now, there were a few vendors here pushing the heck out of that theme this year. <laughs> I'm not going to pick on them at the moment. <laughs> yeah, but you can figure out who they are if you go on the website. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, one, one thing I made a note of in one of my early interviews that I thought was really interesting uh, when I was talking, I jotted down this note and I wrote The Revenge of the Store, which is kind of an obvious observation uh, as, as retailers are getting a better understanding of how to use storefronts. But then I wrote, actually, it's the revenge of the right type of store. Yeah. So it's not just storefronts. It's the right kind of storefronts. And I think a big part of that is is data and, and figuring out how your data on customers can be used to give them a better experience, assuming they're willing to kind of embrace that and opt into that. And and what does that take, right? Because if you if you just assume your storefront is an asset, that's not going to work. You're going to have to rethink how you're doing it, but it seems like there's a connection between what you do on the data side and what you can do in the store. 
So that I think is really interesting. What absolutely 100 percent, and and it's very similar to I heard Matt Alexander from from Neighbourhood Good speaking just yesterday, um, and he he summed it up really. He said, putting a ball pit in the store is not going to to attract the customers putting a bar in the store is not going to attract the customers it's really digging yeah. into to why you're doing it and what does that customer want so I'm hearing lots of lots and lots about how um, the the real bump you get from from opening a store obviously is the sales but actually the online bump you get from it as well so that's yeah. that's when we talk about the right store that that's what it is it's not just you know I'm gonna sell sell products within these four walls it's what does that do to my online presence what does it do to my digital my click and collect my browse online, my buying store, all those different things. And I think that's when you talk about the right store. That for me is, is how I see that really being implemented. Yeah, I, I was at that neighbor, neighborhood goods session as well. And yeah. one, one thing I thought was interesting, he is opening a restaurant, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, but to your point. For the right he, reasons. For the right reasons. But, <laughs> but one really interesting thing that came out of that as well was that, that they're, they're not measuring employees based on like how many sales you get done in your ship right they're they're looking at these relational type sales yeah and and they're really cultivating this advisory thing and 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 so that kind of fits into the restaurant approach right that they're trying to build community and loyalty and one thing he talked about is how folks who come into a store are going to be worth five times as much over their Lifetime. Yeah, the customer lifetime value. In the so it raises as well. some really interesting questions that I've written about last year here as well, which is like, if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna open up a restaurant the store, if we're gonna if we're gonna empower our employees in a different way, we also need to like measure the success differently and also communicate to Wall Street what we're how we're measuring it differently. Yeah, because these old metrics, you know. Uh, foot traffic per square foot or you know whatever it is or sales per yeah. per store are not always going to be the best measurements of your progress right a hundred percent and I think if you're a market analyst you're probably going to have some headaches because those lines are blurring so it's not as clear as saying these are my physical sales these are my digital sales and here's how I'm improving this and here's how I'm improving yeah. this the two coexist now and they're completely interrelated so um, yeah those blurred lines are there for a reason and and retailers really need to consider that so tell me about your your panel. You, I, I really wish I'd been able to attend this. It was called the uh, the uh, harnessing an innovation cus- culture and customer obsession: secrets from four global retailers. And you you were moderating. I guess you had Zappos and Gap and Chloe and Jules USA. That's a pretty nice lineup there. It, it was it was a great lineup. It was a it was a real mix of, of characters, personalities, and brands. So you look at you look at someone like Zappos. You know, ecom owned by Amazon. They've trialed trialed some kind of physical footprint, but you know they are econ pure play. You have someone like Gap Inc. who sits across so many brands, Banana Republic. They're looking at spinning off Old Navy. You've got Chloe, who are you know one of a real traditional luxury brand owned by Richemont, again a real traditional Swiss retailer. And then Jules, so you know a quintessentially British women's fashion, and now they're looking to expand to the U.S. So really different brands, really different uh, people and characters on there. So I think it was a great discussion around. Yeah, how to really be customer-centric, obsess over your customers, their desires, wants, and needs, and that culture of innovation. So I think you'll agree we've heard a lot in the last 72 hours about the you know these innovative initiatives or these different solutions, but a culture of innovation for me is something very different. That's something that you instill at the heart of your organization. And right. a couple of innovative technologies and stuff doesn't make you an innovative company. That that culture is is the next step to success for me. Yeah. So, so was there any interesting takeaways? I know there's like very different brands with different struggles and opportunities, yeah. but were there any things that really s- s- stuck out for you? Yeah, I think there, there were there were a lot of commonalities, and I think someone like someone like Alex Jenov from from Zappos was really interesting, and 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 it's back to your point, John, around empowering your employees. So they see themselves as a customer service company that happens to sell shoes, which you you wouldn't really hear very often from a retailer previously, and and they give yeah. their customer service agents the autonomy to deal with their customers so if that's giving some two hundred dollar trainings for free because the customers had a bad experience yep go ahead if that's sending some flowers because that person's had a bereavement or they're upset they're allowed to do that so empowering your employees employing the right people and, and making them the brand advocates that is that was um, a really interesting one around how to obsess with your customers and then the innovation culture is something is something very different but I think the real key thing was was baby steps and small steps you know we're not talking you know you don't walk out there to the to the biggest stand you can find and lay down 10 million dollars and say right I'm gonna buy this innovative technology it's how do you start that roadmap how do you take small steps to that test and learn 
because that's how you prove to your board and your C-suite and your shareholders mm -hmm. that you are starting to learn and you are starting to bring that ROI because that's how that slowly instills the culture of innovation for me. Yeah. One interesting thing that came out, I had some meetings with like Adobe and Salesforce yeah. uh, because I wanted to dig into their retail stats because they both do like these extensive deep dives and holiday stats and yeah. uh, more than I could ever do on my own. And um, there are a couple of big things that I took out of there. Um, and I'll just throw them out to you and you can see how that jives yeah. with what you're looking at. Um, one big thing was um, was smartphones. Um, and, and I think the interesting thing about smartphones have really crossed over into the commerce device of choice. And the stats aren't all the way there yet, but just for example, like smartphones accounted for 84% of e-commerce growth this holiday season as per Adobe. That's They're up 30%, 37% year over year, right? So what that tells me in a way is that that just makes my the brand's life a little bit easier in some ways because now they can focus on on optimizing for one device, right? So now they don't have to think as much around like how does this work on a computer and then this person's in my store. It's like no, the mobile device is the constant. And and if they're lucky, the mobile app is the constant and the person's already logged in, you already have loyalty going. Yeah. I think that has simplified the omni challenge. So that's one really interesting point. What, what do you think of, of that stuff? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not surprised by those stats. You know, you look at the, the Gen Z generation that's coming up, they have the smartphones glued, glued to their left hand, you know, things like screen time on iPhone. I'm always uh, quite shocked at how long I actually do spend on my phone. And, and right. I'm, a, I'm a millennial, so I think it's even worse for, for Gen Z. But yeah, that, that smartphone is now in, intrinsic in, in the retail journey. And you look at a company called Network, um, a, re a really interesting company. They call themselves the QVC for the for the YouTube generation. They're invested people like LeBron James, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So they they focus on on one moment. So it's not about being omnipresent in in a in a customer's life. It's one moment for one very exclusive product drop. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting way of doing it. And that's all through smartphone as well. So I think mm -hmm. that company is seeing huge growth. It's got some great investment. And, and that, for me, is the epitome of how you, you target those customers, you bring exclusivity, and you put it in the palm of their hand in their smartphone. Let me share also with you, get your reaction to this, um, the rise in so-called BOPUS, buy online, pick up and yeah. store. Um, I wrote that it's as good an indicator as you can find for omni-channel progress, right? Because now stores figure out like how to s integrate, to your point, like the distinction between online and store kind of breaking yeah. down. Um, uh, according to Adobe, that grew 30 five percent year over year from last year and check this out though i wrote um adobe also noted that retailers need to upsell in store they're missing an opportunity to turn bopus into more than just a pickup on a shopping list um anyway i went on to say that's a pretty good picture of where retailers are at now capitalizing on storefronts but not necessarily in transformative ways and during a meeting a uh, subsequent meeting with uh, salesforce's rob garf he's kind of summed up that opportunity to get ahead or fall behind and what he said was Less than 20% of retailers have BOPAs, and those that do haven't really cracked the code on the implications of the physical store yet. So what do you think of that? Yeah, I completely agree. And look, the, the original tactic used to be we'll stick the click and collect right at the back of the shop, and therefore a customer has to walk all the way through, and you know, hopefully they yeah. might find something. But, but that, that, that's just that's, that's rookie stuff for me. That's, you know, that's not very innovative. That's not very forward thinking. Someone like Nordstrom, again, Eric mentioned this morning, you know, they, they really consider where they're opening the store because of the uplift in, in kind of digital and, and the in-store services as well. So they bet on New York. You've seen the new Nordstrom that's open that's cost millions of dollars to produce. And that is all based around those in-store services. So, you know, they have a bar in there. They have all these different things that they want to try and seduce customers once they're there. So you're absolutely right. There's no point having to buy online, pick up in-store unless you're going to try and convert people when they're there but it's really thinking about what's going to do that to that customer you know is it oh, okay well I'm here now I'm, I'm, I might just grab a quick pint and, uh, and try some trainers on or what, what else is it so it's really being considerate of that because like you said once once you've got that customer in store and you're driving that footfall that's when it's time to convert so when customers come to your team at BJSS your retail yeah. specialist what kinds of pain points are they talking about and what do they ask for your help with 
I mean, there's, there's a wealth of pain points all the way from kind of the product availability side all the way through to delivery. So all, all that kind of stuff is, is really difficult. I think something I've seen really particularly with, with some recent clients in, in grocery is, is that product availability piece. So I don't think there's anything worse as a, as a customer than, than going in store, you picked up your item that you want to you buy and you go in store and it's not available. And I think that live product availability is mm. absolutely enormous for, for retailers. So that's something that we've tried to fix with them and having a real view of your inventory because not only does that you know obviously boost profits and, and stops on waste but actually it drives your customer experience as well if products are there they're in the right place and they've got the right size that's enhancing my customer experience all day and, and, and if you get that wrong the competition's there and, and customers will go elsewhere so that's a real real pain point I see and, and something that, um, many retailers are, are keen to fix it's interesting too because that goes back to that first point around the right type of store right like if I'm online trying to figure out availability that information has to coincide with in real time with what's happening in your store because if I drive down there and it and you're out and you said you had it like that's really a frustrating 100%. experience for me and yeah. that's and that's where those blurred lines happen right that's yeah. you know that's the store feeding the online channel and the online channel feeding the store and that should be seamless and the customer doesn't care that it's two separate entities. so you would help advise customers on some of the data problems around that and what to do about them yeah exactly we'll get we get stuck into the data we've got some incredibly talented uh, data engineers and scientists and, and they would jump into that data and work out really where where that's going wrong and then yeah you've got to understand the processes what what why is that going wrong in the process what what's happening and really start to work out you know what what are the solutions and you know is technology the answer if it is great but it's not always the answer to everything sometimes it's a, it's a process mm -hmm. problem or it, it's something else and, and and it's really getting to the bottom of that using the data talking to the people in the store as well I find that absolutely massive I actually worked in a store just in December for one of our clients in grocery and it's absolutely incredible the difference you hear from the people in the head office to the people in store and just doing an eight-hour shift in a store you see all the real problems so I would, I would encourage any retailers listening to this you know mm. get back into your stores you know it, it's quite fun to do a shift for a few hours anyway um, but that's really where you, you hear your customers you listen to your employees and you, and you see your business in operation did you notice some obvious problems just watching Oh, 100%. You know, I, I was there replenishing deliveries and, and you can mm. see, you know, the products are in the wrong place or, or um, you know, customers are looking for things. There's there's three or four different places. Deliveries right. are coming in. They're not sorted. That kind of stuff. And, and yes, the head office get the data and they say, oh, well, sales are down this week. Why has that happened? But actually, you're in the store and you're, and you're seeing that, that, yeah, the problems are evident. So I think one of the interesting questions is, you know, I think for years now, retailers were laboring in this kind of sort of perception of the store closing apocalypse which was never entirely true right yeah um, but but it was it was kind of hanging over and there was this feeling of kind of being off balance pertaining to the the economies of scale mm -hmm. of an Amazon or a Walmart or you you probably have a couple of iconic European brands that fit into that category yeah. also yeah but and the, are you and then and then of course I think you did have some luxury you know, boutique type stores that were a little bit less affected by that because their personalized approach was yeah. always. But then in the middle, there's so many retailers that have kind of struggled, and it seems like now you're starting to see some of them emerge with some clarity around how they're going to compete. Is that kind of what you're seeing too? Yeah, definitely. Look, I mean, 2019 was not a good year for for UK retail for sure. As CVAs, yeah. which are company voluntary agreements, we saw you know the likes of Mothercare, Evan mm. Cycles, all these you know traditional British brands are falling by the wayside. So I think mm. yeah, it's been it's been a really difficult. But a great example is a company called House of Fraser. So um, went into administration, were bought out by Sports Direct, and, and now actually they're starting to turn it around. So you know the death of the department store, we've heard just as much about that as we have the retail apocalypse. And, and right. actually, like you say, almost consolidating, thinking about why we're here, what, 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 why do customers want to come to a department store? What services mm. do we need? How are we laying it out? And actually starting to build that back out again. And, and I think there was a shock there, but I think it's given chance for retailers to st take stock, consolidate, just have a bit of a rethink about where they are. Mm. You've got a bunch of notes you prepared for our podcast. <laughs> Were there any any uh, notes in there yeah, that, I mean, that we got, missed that you wanted to touch well, on? Well, I've got, I've got reams of the stuff. Um, yeah. It's all obviously about NRF, but I think, to be honest, um, it's been absolutely great to see, you know, the CEOs, you know, the Microsoft guys. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that okay. was the takedown <laughs> stuff that I was worried about happening um, during our podcast. Yeah, obviously Satya, we had um, Michelle Gas from Coles, uh, Crate and Barrel, all those CEOs, which I think is fantastic. And it's, be, and it's great to see, you know, the people shaping the industry. 
but I think we've heard a lot about kind of the what and the why of we do things. The one thing I, I keep trying to push and I, I wish I could ask these people questions is the how. So we talk about, you know, go back to go back to thinking about your customer, go back to the basics, but at the how of how do how do retailers do this, you know, how do you implement it? What happens if it goes wrong? For me, that I don't tend to hear too much about that stuff and I think that's the most interesting because what I would hate is a retailer see, you know, neighborhood goods or show fields and go, we need to slide in our store, we need to make a really snazzy store. But actually, it's not about that, it's the how of, what do my customers want, right, okay, what, what technology is happening, you know, what's innovation, what's coming down the road in five, ten years, and therefore, what does that mean and how do I start to implement that? So I think that's something I haven't heard as much as I would like to have heard this, uh, this, um, this show. But obviously, the information and the, and the wealth of it and the, the diverse range of it has been amazing.